on the matter of properly interpreting the Bible or anything in writing. Since the interpretation of a passage, any passage in the Bible, via the proper use of the normative rules of language, context, and logic, proves itself out to be the most trustworthy, non-contradictory, immutable, consistent interpretation of passages in the Bible, then the interpretation by these rules will not be something that can be changed or modified into something different by information derived elsewhere in the Bible or outside of the Bible, as some contend. People do this to me all the time. Well, that's just not the only verse. Doesn't matter. It's a completed sentence with a completed thought following the rules of language, context, and logic within its own framework of context. It says what it says. John 3.16, you believe you have eternal life. But you have to do more than that. Well, then John 3.16 is missing something, or you've interpreted it differently, or whatever. But you can't violate the rule of context, or the rules, any of the rules of reading, to make it your own. The author made a mistake. So, become a Buddhist. Get a Buddhist book. Well, they're full of chock full of errors, too according to the way you want to read it. On the other hand, the normative rules <coughs> permit referral to parallel passages when they are stipulated or referred to by the author in order to define specific words or the context of a passage in hand. And parallel passages, normatively interpreted, meaning par passages that have the possibility of confirming what you learn in one passage, and it's also saying the same thing in another, without congealing them, convoluting them, changing them. Sometimes even the author's work a couple of chapters later, but not another author's work, um, can be used to change another author's work. So in parallel passages, normatively interpreted, may also be used to corroborate, not to change, alter, the meaning of a passage at hand, but not change it. Since the interpretation of any passage in the Bible via the proper use of the normative rules of language, context, and logic proves itself to be the most trustworthy, non-contradictory, immutable, consistent interpretation of passages in the Bible or any piece of writing, then the interpretation by these rules will not be something that can be changed or modified into something different by information derived elsewhere in the Bible or outside of the Bible, and still accurately represent the Bible as some contend. Objectors to this principle of immutability established by the normative rules contend that one cannot just take a particular passage to teach some biblical truth, such as the one which is contained in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of not of yourselves, Gift of God, not by works, lest any man but should, should boast. He said, there it is. Faith. In a moment's time, the non-going present results forever because of that verb, you have been saved. It's a perfect tense. So, well, but. No, you can't say but. There's not something elsewhere. I understand, but there's something elsewhere that says something different. Okay. If something elsewhere says something different, Find another book to read that might be a little more trustworthy to your liking. Or John 3.16, same thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one only Son for your sins, that whosoever believes that, that information about the Son of God being given for your sins, Jesus Christ is his name, as they keep on reading in John 3, and hundreds of other passages, all of which properly and normatively interpreted with their own context, teach that believing, a moment of believing, in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, results in being saved unto eternal life. Objectors to this normatively arrived at interpretation falsely maintain that there are other passages throughout the Bible, all the New Testaments, that teach on salvation unto eternal life and add to what authors Paul, John, and others say a man must do to be saved unto eternal life. That's what they maintain. I haven't found one. You can misread it. One guy brought up Romans 10, 9, and 10. For with a heart man is justified, with a mouth confess one is saved. Yes, two kinds of justification, salvation. With a heart, one is justified, and with a mind, the ability to, de 
to, to discern. So with your mind, you discern that you believe and you're justified, declared righteous unto eternal life. Abraham on. Adam and Eve on. Same thing. Well, what about this confess with your mouth? That's a deed. It's what's well, not there in John 3.16 and it's disallowed in Ephesians 2 a through 10 which we just got reading. So what is that? That's another kind of salvation. The preservation of the value of your life. Deliverance from some danger. So to repeat, objectors to this normatively arrived at interpretation, each passage has its own message, can't be altered or modified by something else, falsely maintain that there are other passages throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments, that teach one on, on salvation unto eternal life and add to what authors Paul, John, and others say a man must do to be saved unto eternal life. This implies that the passages about salvation unto eternal life in Ephesians, John, and in many other books, are contradictory, incomplete with errors of omission, when normatively interpreted by themselves within their own particular contexts, without being modified to conform with the rest of what they falsely state this, the Bible teaches via their own methodology of interpretation. But this is an approach to the Bible which would make the understanding of any passage in the Bible unreachable until one had completely mastered every pa other passage in the uh, every book of the Bible and allowed for passages to be modified into their final meanings. You ever read a book like that? So one cannot master the first verse he reads in the Bible, wherever it is, until he masters every verse in the Bible beforehand. Wait a minute. If this system is of interpretation is true, then it makes sense. Circular reasoning, you'll never get to know the Bible. Then it would require more than a lifetime of careful study, more than a lifetime of careful study, to master the first verse when it begins to read the Bible. So you'll never know what it is. So you'll never get to share your faith. Then there is no language that has such a complex structure that can convey such indetermination within each verse so that one might understand that when reading a verse in the Bible, its meaning cannot be determined until every other verse in the Bible is fully mastered. Wow. You have to memorize the genealogies. All kinds of stuff. A lot of stuff that may not even apply to you in your whole life. Just in case. That might affect the meaning of John 3.16 or whatever verse you're starting to read. Then, the saints of Old Testament times also would not have had all the information they needed to be saved unto eternal life. They're all going to go to hell. Because they did not have the completed Bible with the 27 books of the New Testament to study and master to determine those other verses they, they memorized in the Old Testament. It makes sense. People just go on with this. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, and Moses, all the Old Testament saints would have been placed in the condemned part of Hades to perish forever in the lake of fire since they were not provided with New Testament revelation. Wow. Point D, then the Old Testament, Ephesians and Gospel of John, every book of the Bible, is indeterminate without a full understanding of every other book of the Bible, every passage, every verse, every word. And there are some passages I didn't come to understand, like John chapter 3, thus one is born of water and the Spirit cannot enter the kingdom of God. That didn't make sense for babies in the womb. Years later, a professor explained it to me. Unless one is born of water, He's talking that Nicodemus Jesus is, or the passage is talking about Nicodemus. Born of water means born of the Spirit. Water is a figure of speech for the Spirit. Not in the fleshly realm, because flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit is the very next verse, right after the one I just read. So, being born again is not something you would get by utilizing anything in the physical realm. It's all spiritual. So, born of water is figurative word for the Spirit. So, what does the other half of it say? Born of water and the Spirit, or and the spiritual realm. So, if you're born of water and of the spiritual realm, there you go. So, it can't be physical water. So, all these people think you're going to get water baptized. It's not talking about that. Water baptized is always symbolized an event that's an actual event. 
Then the rules to interpret the Bible are beyond the normative rules of language, context, and logic available to all men, with no clear declaration anywhere in the Bible or anywhere else as to what those rules are, as to what each verse's meaning is dependent upon. Then this puts the Bible out of reach of mankind, except perhaps the select few, who knows, who allegedly claim to have such a unique, special gift from God, and they and know every single expression, word, and meaning from cover to cover. Of course, a lot of pastors think that way. They don't want you to do any thinking yourself. But then, when you're supposed to study and show yourself approved, does that apply to you? Does the pastor tell you to go home and study your Bible? A lot of them do. But don't come up with your own meaning. Then, point H. For most, if not all, of mankind, the Bible is impossible to read, and therefore it is untrustworthy. And I have people tell me that. One guy did tell me. The meanings of words changed. So who knows what it says? Well, I told them. We have ancient documents. Our Constitution. Well, some people think it's been changed because the meanings of words have changed. And nobody knows what it means. So, we have any, any anything goes. See, that's nonsense. There are different additional meanings added in the expression of any language. But the older meanings remain intact, especially for those authors that use those meanings in earlier times. They're not still alive. You know what Shakespeare means? Sure, just learn a little bit of Shakespeare in English. Mostly, you can determine it, but there's some words there that you have to figure out and let it fit the context. On the other hand, just as a cook can follow the directions of a recipe in order to produce the stated result of, for example, an angel food cake without having to go to another recipe like one for roast beef, so an individual can follow the normative rules of language, context, and logic and read that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, John 3, 16, and hundreds of other verses stipulate within their own particular context that believing, a moment of believing, in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, results in being saved unto eternal life without having to go to other alleged passages which might make or add corrections and or directions, even if there were any in the Bible, and there are none. You have John 3.16, and, and go to uh, Romans 10.9 and 10. Finish reading this. Confusion. When you believe in God's one only somebody given you your sins, what do you get immediately? Present tense possession of eternal life. How long is that to last? Well, eternal life is eternal. Right? Most of the time when the word eternal appears, way back in ancient English times. And when we talk about what the Greek words were, the Hebrew words were, it still means forever. Not depending upon what another passage says. In this matter, there are any directions in the Bible, and there are none. In this matter, one can relatively quickly and easily discern the teachings of the Bible and build an understanding of the Bible by studying one passage at a time, following the normative rules of interpretation, language, context, and logic, without years of agonizing examination of the entire Bible. Thereby, one can determine what the Bible is saying one passage at a time and build on that. Passages in the Bible, by and large, declare a clear message of what they mean by themselves within their own context, or at times with the use of one or more parallel passages that are stipulated or referred to as a cross-reference by the original author. Sometimes he, he stipulates just as it says in Hebrews. Sometimes he'll say just as it says in Hebrews and modify the message. It's all about the author and what he is saying, not what you interpret it as. You interpret it as the author is saying by the normative rules of language, context, and logic. So the original author and the passage in hand in order to provide definitions of terms or to help define the context of the original passage, that, that has occurred a number of times. By and large, it's just a simple, careful reading as you learn to read and began to read in the third grade or before and continue. Some of these vocabulary words now, the third grader wouldn't know, but you'll learn them as you grow. You become of a cannibal age, 
find a teacher that explain these things and you'll know what they mean. According to the normative rules, 